So this morning, I want to suggest to us all that we start looking at our work differently. I want to tell you a couple of stories to sort of uh, illustrate that and what I mean by that. First, I'm going to start with a story told by American writer David Foster Wallace. And he gave this story at a uh, keynote, graduation keynote, at Kenyon College in 2005. There are these two fish swimming along one morning, and they happen upon an older fish who nods at them as they swim by and says, turns to them and says, hey, fellas, how's the water? And the two fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one of the fishes turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? Wallace's point is merely that some of the most obvious and important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Now, I want you to put that story, we will return to it over there. You'll understand, hopefully, uh, why I told you that story. So at some point around, oh, 2007, I had been, I looked, looked back on my career, and I had been part of uh, a number of different t teams of engineers, and lucky enough to manage a couple of them. And they were just really good. I felt really blessed to have been part of these, these teams at these different companies. Um, and I wondered about that. I wondered about, they were, they were really good. And I thought, well, given how insanely complex, a number of you have hundreds, if not thousands, of servers, maybe multiple data centers, uh, instances, and, and maybe millions of time series metrics and alerts and dashboards and all of that, given how insanely complex our ways, given how much uncertainty we face every day, I'd look at these team of engineers and I'd say, what makes them good? What makes them good at that? Because by all measures on paper, they, we shouldn't be good at this. What makes them good at solving tricky problems? What makes them good at diagnosing outages, complicated things when the pressure's on? Well, first I thought, well, maybe these teams aren't good. Maybe they're just lucky. Well, I'm an engineer. So that's largely unsatisfying. I don't think luck is a good strategy. I thought about all of the challenges that teams face. And I think that now, that I think that it's tempting to take an approach that people are good because of the tools they have. And I don't think that's true. Certainly it's important, but it's not true that I would say that these pilots here are good at flying solely because their planes are well designed. And what about teamwork? What about teamwork in all of this? Quite often what will happen in, in uh, talks at Velocity and other conferences, we will almost uh, make a tacit assumption that we are going to, unless you're in the culture or organizational dynamics track, every other track assumes one engineer mind, one screen. Just because you get a group of skilled individuals together doesn't mean that they will be a great team. Think about any musical super band ever. Asia was not a good band. But then I realized maybe I wasn't talking about great engineers solving hard problems under pressure, sometimes in emergencies even. Maybe what I was wondering about is what makes people good now? I won't be the first Velocity speaker to have the word failure on a slide. I certainly won't be the last. But back then I thought, well, maybe the best way of, of, uh, to, of understanding this expertise is to look at outages, right? Maybe what it'll do is look at all the failures we have. And that's an evergreen topic, and we love to talk about those topics. Because Murphy's Law, bugs will happen, outages will happen, and there's certainly plenty of research on how software fails. But what I have come to learn is actually that isn't that backwards? Why would we look at failures to understand why people are good at their work? Well, I now know this, is that Murphy's Law is actually quite wrong. Anything that can go wrong almost never does. We don't notice when it doesn't go wrong. And the fact is, is we succeed much, much more often than we fail. So I'll come back again to what makes them good. 
And I've come to the same conclusion that others have, which is in order to understand how teams work as well as they do, we have to not just look at outages and failures. We have to look at how normal work gets done. Instead of asking, why did we have an outage today? What if we were to ask, what are all the things that went into making it so that we didn't have an outage today on a day that we didn't have an outage? It's a different question and with a much more uh, difficult answer, maybe. So I had these unanswered questions, and I did what anybody does when you have these unanswered, potentially existential questions. I took enough LSD to kill a horse, and I spent a week in the forest. <laughs> Come on, I'm not the first person to do that. <laughs> I did not do that, I'm just kidding. Um, I read as much as I could at the time, and I pulled on as many threads as I could on this topic about how people behave and how people uh, think about their work under time pressure. If I were to put on this slide everything that I've read, then it would be a completely unreadable slide. But I kept pulling on these threads, and I'd find this uh, related topic, and I'd find this related topic. You may have read some of these books. They certainly make the rounds in our tribe. This led me to a master's degree program. I, I accidentally joined it. Um, Lund University in Sweden, this is a master's degree program in human factors and system safety, which is exactly what I realized that I wanted to know, and where I might be able to get answers. And the best part about it is it's so very Swedish. It was built for people who, who have jobs, and it was very multidisciplinary and, uh, and welcoming to, um, to people who aren't from Sweden. This course opened my eyes to see, like those fish, what water was for the first time. And this is my suggestion to you this morning. I could, I, for the first time in, 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 uh, in this was a two-year program, I could see some of these issues and these topics through multiple lenses, and then I learned how to think critically about them, about how people think about technology as they're using it, and how they think about the technology will look like, or benefit, or cost them in the future. My classmates are the best. These are my classmates. And by the time it was all over, we felt like a really, really a, a, a close family. But look at the domains that they come from. Wildland firefighting, air traffic control, aviation, child welfare services. My program was multidisciplined. And the most important part of this journey was that it became clear to me that I shouldn't actually be looking for answers. I instead needed to learn how to ask better questions. It became so clear to me that these topics were of paramount importance to our field that I tricked a number, I mean, convinced a number of people from that field, from those research fields, to come and speak to our world. My professor, Johan Bergstrom, Dr. Richard Cook, David Woods, Stephen Shark, two weeks ago, uh, a man by the name of Todd Conklin, who's managed safety and system safety, human factors, at Los Alamos National Labs, gave a uh, tutorial in New York, and it was excellent. So, here's just a glimpse of some of the things that I've learned that I can no longer unsee. The first is that some of the most seminal research on how people work with technology comes from studying actual work, not under controlled conditions in a laboratory. This is not Psychology 101 that you might remember from university freshman year. This is velocity. We talk about real shit here. We don't talk about theoretical or abstract worlds uh, that, that could happen, maybe. We talk about what happens in the real world here. The thing is, is doing this type of research is really hard. But when you do understand and get practice at the methods and the tools and the approaches on doing it, the insights are absolutely incredible. Sort of like fish recognizing, this is, is water. I know what water is now. Another topic that's relevant to velocity is the idea of a rich history of research surrounding the idea when people are absolutely astonished at how the technology they're using is actually behaving. 
Now, at this conference and many others like it, we frequently will call for automate all the things. There's a number of vendors here who will almost certainly want to underscore the importance of automation. And to be sure, this is very critical. But I'm going to be strong on this and say that we need to stop pretending that automation can't have unintended consequences. And the fact is, is that it does, and it does every day. For the most part, we don't see those consequences because they don't result in catastrophic failure. And they don't result in catastrophic failure because of you, humans. This magical promise of automation, sometimes starting in the 1950s, has been proven wrong over and over. And we don't have enough time to go through all of the myths and the ironies that automations and what automation promises has been wrong over and over and over, sometimes at the cost of human lives. This is not to say that I am uh, against automation. It's actually critical, and there's no possible way we could do our job without it. But we cannot be like this ostrich and ignore that there are myths. For example, one example is, is that one of the magical promises is that it will relieve us of needing as many people as we do. You automate something, we, don't, we won't need that person who was doing that. Well, let me ask you this. It's rhetorical because it's a keynote and you can't, answer, can't ask questions. If automation does this, then why the hell am I having to hire more and more people at Etsy the more I automate things? I don't know if you've seen the job board. So automation is a double-edged sword. We can't do without it. But that doesn't mean that we're good at working with it. I want you to think really quickly. I want you to think right now about an outage that you've been involved in recently, that you've been resolving. I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Have you asked yourself while you're staring at that laptop, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Have you ever thought that inner, inner monologue in your, the back of your mind? What's, this, what's going on? What's it doing? Why is it doing that? What will it do next? How did it get into the state? Or I would ask, how did this ever work? All of those questions, except for the last one, all of those questions were what pilots reported to Earl Weiner, a human factors researcher, when he asked them in evaluating and research of introducing new pieces of automation into the Boeing 757, and this was in the 1980s. These similarities between different domains are much, much broader and critical than we think in this room. We've spent years focusing on preventative design. Fault tolerance and distributed systems is something that we absolutely have to get good at. We should focus on it. But we can't pretend that that, just like the design of those planes, are solely what makes us successful. I'll assert that this next question I'm gonna put up here is the question is we as a field have been focusing on for at least a decade, and I think it's a really important question. What is needed for the design of systems that prevents or limits catastrophic failure? If there's some sort of pride for an ops engineer, it might be this question. But if we were to look at how real work gets done, we find that our designs and our understanding of systems, the ones we built and we designed, are not objectively complete. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pose a different question. When our preventative designs fail us, and they do, how do teams of engineers successfully resolve those catastrophes or potential catastrophes, and they do. Which means that we have to look closer, not at software, but at wetware. Thankfully, there's a wealth of research on these topics. As one example, and I will tweet this paper when I'm done with the talk later today, is Dave Woods and Jennifer Watts, who did a study at NASA's Mission Control, where they found multiple ways that diverse teams adapted to critical issues in ways that they called 
cooperative, cooperative advocacy. And there are more connections that you will see in this paper than I think you will have in any of recent IEEE or ACM. When we look at a snippet of code, how do we understand it? By the way, these, are, these two snippets of code produce the exact same results, but your brain is going to do different work when you read it, certainly different work when you write it. P.S. That last, this bot one on the bottom, it's one line of code. Simpler, right? <laughs> this is a quote that I've taken from a vendor uh, who sells sort of tools and in, in, in sort of our space, and it could be any vendor, and it could be any of one of us. I have certainly said something like this on their website in the marketing materials. This makes it, if you have our product, this makes it much easier to maintain and reason about your code. Another one says, these changes fix a number of confusing exceptions, making it much easier to reason about. What does it mean to reason about software? How does reasoning happen? Do our teammates help us reason? Or do they hinder us? Discovering how people reason about their work and their world is critically important, but yet we don't pay much attention to it. We pay attention to what's behind the keyboard and the monitor, but not so much what's in front of the keyboard and the monitor. When, now, when I look at a team, no matter where it is, at Etsy or anywhere else that I visit, I, th I think, I look at engineers and I think, and I look at teams and I look at the problems they're working on, and these are the types of questions that come to me now. What are they thinking about? What are they focusing on while they're working on this problem? What did they trade off when they designed something? Engineering is about trade-offs. There are no correct answers. If you want correct answers, go into mathematics. Engineering's about best answers, not right ones. So there are trade-offs. What did they trade off? How did they perceive the problem that they're actually working on? Do they think that the problem that they're working on is critical or ancillary or trivial? One thing that's guaranteed is, is that if it doesn't work out, we could almost certainly look back and say with ease in the uh, rose-colored glasses of hindsight that it was critical. They might not have thought that. And here's my favorite one. During an outage, in the absence of any other information other than customer support or your, or your friend texted you and said your website's down or the API isn't working, do en engineers use any rules of thumb? Do they use any shortcuts? Do they have any heuristics? because you don't have any information yet, and you've got a million places to start, do you use any rules of thumb to s pick where to start? Well, this is something that I do actually know the answer to, and because it's the topic of my master's thesis. And the answer is yes, not very surprisingly. Um, if you're having difficulty sleeping tonight, you can download my master's thesis. Um, it's actually... Actually, no, I think it's pretty good, actually. Um, uh, I would say that we need more of this. This thesis represents not just this body of work that I did, but I think hopefully will open the door for others. I've talked about the importance of research in our domain, and this is not just lip service. This is, this is a pre-printed chapter for an, uh, that I wrote for an upcoming book called Human Factors in Ergonomics and Practice. And this chapter around web engineering and operations sits alongside human factors research in practice in mining, nuclear power plants, aviation, air traffic control, surgical trauma, and I think it belongs there because those domains actually need us to share our stories with them. If we do that, then my hope is, is that we, as a broader community, will have a better understanding of what water is. So, that's my talk. Thank you.